Market research. This is the summary summary of the summary. We have a full semester length course. So in one hour, we're going to give you a quick highlights reel of something that takes 12 weeks to teach and is a bit of a highlights reel in and of itself. Market research is a huge area of the marketing industry because the nature of marketing is evidence-led and market research is a technique of evidence gathering really tuned up to support marketing activities. So there's a couple of things that you need to appreciate from the outset. First, all market research needs to be purpose-led, purpose-driven, and it is a means to the end. The reason you run market research is to provide evidence for a decision. If you're not making a decision, then you're not doing marketing properly. But also, running research for the sake of gathering data, just randomly pooling and spooling up data, is not useful. So, we're not, as marketers, in favor of this idea of collect everything and analyze later. We are very much about create a reason to collect, use that collection, make that decision, measure what happens next. So a couple of the key ideas we're going to look at in terms of research problems, data collection, sense making, it all comes down to your purpose, you create the collection so you can make a decision. Now also, the thing to understand is that market research is heavily intertwined with a lot of the concepts covered in intro. Ideas like the external analysis, that's a market research activity. Market segmentation is built upon research data. It is a process that needs evidence to make decisions, so it's a research-led event. Customer satisfaction scores are research inputs that lead to decisions. Is the customer satisfied? Continue as we were. If it's the customer dissatisfied, make a change, measure again. Advertising effectiveness, uh, reach and recall. Who saw it? What did they remember? Basically, boils down to is if a marketer needs to make a decision, market research is the way in which we're going to find out what we need to know to make that decision. So looking at a couple of the fundamentals of marketing research. First thing to appreciate is all marketing is a form of experimental practice. And it comes down to if we undertake a marketing activity, then will the customer behave in the way we want to? And as a result of activity X, what was reaction, brackets Y, of the customer? So if we raise the price, lower the price, change the distribution, these are all experiments and the world is our laboratory in that sense. So all marketing is experimental practice. All marketing therefore requires the results to be written down. And market research is a means by which we get to capture and write down the results. So if we think about it from the perspective of a research question and the natural marketing experiment, the research question is what does the customer need? The product question in the natural marketing experiment is does this feature do better than what our competitor is doing? For price, our question is how are we positioned relatively to our competitors? Where are we on the positioning map? Then our marketing question as well is, will the customer buy the product at the price we're offering? It? So we have all of these natural marketing experiments and we have the market research questions. And we take something like, again, with the promotion, what media channels do our market 
does our target market use? We find out the media channels, and then we're like, okay, well, is, this, is it worth us being on TikTok in order to run branded videos to improve our reputation in the eyes of the target market? And that is, again, we would be able to build an experiment, run the content, and make a decision, stay or go. So let's talk about the sequence of marketing research. Your first key to marketing research is the research question. That will drive everything else. A research question is fundamentally strategy for research. You're asking something for a reason because you're asking something in order to be able to answer a question to make a decision. Having established what your question is, that drives then the type of data that's useful to answer the question. A trap for many people is to go method first and then say, well, what can I use to solve? I've got this cool method what can I solve with it? As opposed to asking the question of what's the problem we need to know? What's the problem we need to understand? What's the decision we need to make? How do we put the two together? So then we go into the data collection. Then we go into identify the type of data required, create a process, collect the data, run the results, interpret and answer the question. So let's get this off. Developing the research question. Now, one of the things about market research is that it's got to come out the other end with an answer. One of those answers can genuinely be, try again. Results unclear. Please try again later. So you can full magic eight ball the situation. Or you can come back and go, we need to clarify. We need to specify. We need to go. You can start with a macro level question and go, OK, we need to dive deeper. Uh, so basically, what you're looking at here is the market research. You need a clear problem. You need a clearly stated problem so you can give yourself a, an opportunity to have a clearly stated answer. And that's the sole reason. It's, it's like our marketing metrics. You can't measure something if you've got an unclear statement of what it is that you're trying to measure. So some of the question types we have are basically, how did the consumer behave? Counting. Why did the consumer behave? Understanding. And if we change a factor of our marketing activity, how will the customer likely respond? So to do this, we, we look at a couple of different types of data. The qualitative data, this is the difficult data. Now, there will be people out there who are going to use the phrase hard data. Oh, yes, quantitative. It's hard data. Now, it's easy data, and it's soft data, and it's squishy, and it's malleable. The thing about qualitative is qualitative requires human interpretation, which is where it gets a bit of its... Uh, I won't say bad reputation, but where people who are a bit fond of trying to say that numbers are impartial like to go and say, oh, well, ours was interpreted by a machine. It's like, no, it wasn't. Your maths was done by a machine. Your result was interpreted by a human. All marketing research is subjective in the sense that it's a human answering a question with a human doing the interpretation to make the human's decision. We don't run objectivity. We don't run pure logic, math-driven only objectivity in this business. So your qualitative absolutely smashes the why and how question out of the park. It's slower. It's complicated. There are some machine-assisted things. But anyone who's flogging an AI, qualitative AI software, is just lying to you. Quantitative. It's all about the numbers. It's good for predictions. It does a really good job of fortune telling and giving you percentage chances of outguessing the human. Uh, it's faster because it's mathematically driven. Computers are good with maths. It's easier because it's mathematically driven and 
no, computers are good with maths, and it's definitely soft and squishy because you can do a lot of manipulation to the results and hide it behind the objectivity of maths. Three out of four people, three out of four people agree. Now, 75% agree, or one in four agree. It's the same answer, just depends what they're agreeing to. So one in four or three out of four. Uh, 75%, 25%, bigger numbers have necessarily no greater value than smaller numbers because it's about the question you're trying to answer. And if you're looking for a market niche, then 25 is a better number than 75 because you want smaller and more targeted. So it's got to be, your data has to be driven by the question you want to answer and your data cannot be done. You can't select your data based on preconceptions of, oh, subjective bad, quasi-objective good. So the other thing I appreciate is that anyone who's going to tell you that there's a wrong form of data collection is not, doesn't know what they're doing. There's only the best fit. Now, some of us specialize in types of data collection. Nobody needs to be a data collection generalist unless they want to be. But there are some forms of data where, as a predominantly qualitative researcher in my professional career, I will go, hmm, that's going to need quant. I'll bring a friend. So it's all about answering the question, getting the right data to give you the best chance to understand your answer. So in terms of things like uh, the two different styles, the qualitative versus the quantitative, the most common in marketing, we're all used to the concept of the focus group. The observational data is really cool. And let the market research tell you the story on that one. And the interviews. Interviews are always fun because it's one-on-one -on -one deep dive. Observational is what's the world doing and how do I interpret it? Observational can also be, what's the world doing? How do I write it down and count it? Focus group, group of people around a, court, around a table, let's talk about what's taking place. Qualitative also covers the content of social media. Quantitative, on the other side, has a whole bunch of social media metrics around likes, shares, subscribes, retweets, reblogs, lots of big county numbery things. Uh, Survey results, stats and predictive measures, sales, actual hard, uh, hard to count because of the sheer volume it takes place with, retail data. Scanner data is now uh, a, almost a field in its own right, interpreting the information that comes from the checkouts almost in real time. And sales figures. The ultimate quantitative data in marketing is how many units did we move, how much money did we get for it. Just on the way past, I want to put the boot into the net promoter score. I want to see this, this measure dead and buried because it's rubbish. And I want to explain why it's rubbish so you understand why it's a bad marketing tool. The question that the Net Promoter Score uses is they say, how likely, so that's the first thing, that's a subjective guess of how likely am I to do something, to recommend this company to a friend or colleague. Now, it's not about the value offer, it's not about the question, it's not about the service received, it's not about your satisfaction, it's would you recommend the company to someone else? And here's where it's a uh, right kick in the face for marketers. It's rubbish. The results are, if you say, on a scale of strongly disagree to strongly agree, nines and tens are promoters. Yay, great, awesome. They would recommend your company to a colleague or a friend. Sevens to eights, wait, what? No, they already, they already said they're going to probably do that. They're above the 50% average here. That's, no, wait, no. 
the idea that someone who is a 7 out of 10 likely to um, rate your company or recommend your company is somehow a passive, neutral or bad thing is completely misunderstanding how maths works and an absolute bastardization of everything we value as marketers when it comes to market research. And the detractor idea, the idea that anyone who's 50-50 likely, toss a coin likely, might, maybe, maybe not, is somehow a detractor, is wrong. It's taking away where actual detraction resides. If someone's between zero and five, if they're zero to four, then yeah, they're, they're a problem, they're a detractor. If they're five, they're neutral. Maybe. Five, six is neutral. Sevens to ten are still within the realms of very, very likely to tell you something. The problem is, because this bastardization of a scale exists, people have now gone into doing things like the five star ratings on Uber, where if you don't give someone, if you're not scoring a five, then you're getting a zero. This is taking nuance and basically smashing yourself in the face with a brick when you, what you really wanted to do was perhaps scratch an itch. It's like, let's get a brick, smash it into our faces, look, we scratch an itch. It does more damage than it does good. It's the idea that if we're not all at somewhere up in there, then everything's gone horribly wrong. It, at the same time, we do stupid things like we will give you a high distinction in this course is 80%. Apparently, a distinction is a passive. So it's just bad data. It's based on a flawed premise. And now it's gone off and infected a bunch of other places where a nuanced range, three out of five is things are going acceptable, things are going okay. Four out of five is things are going better than okay. Five out of five is, oh my, that is really going well. But two and a half is things are on the cusp. 2.6, things are in the positive. Here, this scale, at zero to 10, and only counting the two dots at the end, realistically then, only counting the dot at the end, it's wasting. It's wasting everyone's time and it's wasting, it's ruining a whole bunch of services and products and it's making it harder for us to get nuanced data, which makes it harder for us to answer questions, which makes it harder for us to do market research that's of any value. Because the longer that it, this infects the system, the more that you have to give, short of getting murdered by your Uber driver, it's five stars or they're fired, means that we're losing nuance when we go to thing, ask any market research question anywhere else. I really hate the net promoter score and I want to see it gone. Because look, it defeats a whole bunch of the market research. Particularly, when you start asking the questions of, all right, data collection process. What is the purpose of the research? Why are we asking the question? Are we asking the question of, is the customer satisfied? If we're asking that question, then that's not the question. That's not satisfaction. So what's the purpose of the research? How much money do you have? And budget is money, time, and resources. What's the desired outcome? What do you need to know? What do you want to know? What techniques best meet the acquisition of that knowledge? So. What you need to do is you need to always start with the secondary data. At the university, one of the things that we emphasize really heavily is getting you to use secondary sources to get you familiar by default going, hmm, problem to be solved. What's the existent body of knowledge? What can I learn from it? It's why we ask you to use references and assignments. It's why we get you to use Google Scholar. Why we want you in the library looking things up in the databases. We want you to start from the best platform. Because if you start with the secondary data, then you can understand more about 
what is needed to solve the problem. Before, if you go straight into primary data, then you won't know whether, in fact, a solution already exists. It just needs to be found in the secondary data. Whether the context, a similar context has been addressed in the past, and maybe you could build on those previous um, insights. So primary data is only to be used when you've exhausted secondary. And this is a really important thing, is that as marketers, there's this sense that we just run around the place firing out surveys left, right, and center, because that's the high visibility. It's the magician's hand you can see is when the survey comes to you, as opposed to all the secondary data that you can analyze to see what else do we currently know. So if we do this from the, you know, what does the customer think of our new product? You've got sales figures, you've got feedback, you've got frontline staff feedback, you've got social media sentiment analysis, you've got emails received, you've got focus, you've got uh, content from feedback forms. And then, having gathered all of that, you can go and decide, do you have enough information to proceed? Has the question been answered? If it hasn't been answered, then you can go, well, what's the best way to explore next? An online survey? Or, and or a focus group. What do you think? Do you like? Why do you like? Those are, but if you find out here from the social media sentiment analysis and the feedback channels and a whole series of staff, the staff feedback forums and the staff are saying, hey, this new product is catching fire when it shouldn't. Our fire prevention blanket can spontaneously combust if exposed to heat. You don't need to go and run a survey saying, so, did you like our fire blanket? You always need to go to your secondary so, so you've got context for your primary. Now, data only exists in the content of it's a starting point, it's a building block. 2001 is dedicated to the whole of the research process. But basically, data processed becomes information. Information processed becomes insight, which is then used to create recommendations. Data is not valuable by itself. Data must be analyzed and processed to be turned into information. And information is what you use to generate insight. If you don't do the first three steps, you fail to in the purpose of market research. And that's the thing, all results are subject to interpretation. Raw numbers are raw numbers, they're uncooked. Basically it's this, interpreting raw data, well, running raw data output without interpretation is the salmonella of market research. You need to go back to the research question and say, what does my interpreted data output, my analysis and my interpretation of the analysis do to progress an answer to this research question. If it doesn't progress an answer, then you keep going. Now you risk at this stage is that you look at your question, you look at your data and go, well, if I manipulate and modify my data, I can answer my question. Well, no, you can't answer your question, you can lie but you won't be answering the question. So the whole point, the function, the purpose is market research exists to provide evidence for decision making and actionable results come from the decision. If you can't make a decision based on the research you've done, do more research. If you can't answer the question based on the research you're trying to do, check the question can be answered and then go back and check your method. The final phase of all market research is to act on the decision. Again, one of the things we do with the assignments is we train you to collect a body of secondary data, read it, interpret it, and then act on it. Assignments that require decision-making processes are training grounds for, I have a question, I have done my secondary, I've acquired my knowledge, I'm making my interpretation, I now need to make a decision, commit, and in this case, in an assignment's case, write your response. In a marketer's 
case, take action on the decision. So, market research. It is a huge domain, huge area. We have a full length semester subject on it, which is why we're only just skimming the surface here. It's an area where if you've got a strong mathematical orientation, there's quantitative work. If you've got a strong linguistics, words and imagery orientation, there's qualitative work. If you like neither of those things, there's always futurism. But there's plenty of opportunities to work, to skill up as a market researcher and to work in the creation of solutions to problems by getting the right data, putting it through the correct analysis so that you can interpret it for a recommendation. Because it's all about the payload. If you're not going for that, if you're not being able to make a decision off the back of your market research, your market research went wrong, go off, do it again. <laughs>